they pushed between eight and a hundred people into those wagons. And we had arrived at Auschwitz. We did not realize the location that we were and what's going to happen to us. We were ordered to leave all the luggage at the railroad station. The only luggage that my father was able to take with him was his talus bag, which contained the talus and tefillin. When one of the officers saw that he has that bag under his arm, he grabbed it from my father and threw it down onto the floor. My father asked him, please, I only want that one item. The Gestapo said, man, where you are going, you are not going to need it. We didn't know what it meant. I know now. Hello, everybody, and thank you for clicking on this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Um, an amazing episode with Mrs. Dolly Rabinovich. Rabinovich. Uh, an incredible Holocaust survivor. An amazing story of resilience, of strength. She is Kananahara, 95 years old, and she shared with vivid memories what she went through in Auschwitz, what liberation was like, um, what would happen to her family in the camps, all in this episode of Meaningful People. I feel right now, myself and Emma both felt that it's super important that this episode uh, comes out now. Given what's going on in the world, it seems like a lot of the world forgot what we as Jewish people went through. And you can't forget it when you're hearing what this guest says. Um, unfortunately, Momo couldn't be here for this episode. He had a last second emergency he had to tend to. So I had to go solo for this one, but I really hope you enjoy this episode. This episode is sponsored by our friends at Albert and Associates. Thank you, Albert and Associates. Guys, girls, women, men, you need financial advice, you need life insurance, you need to get your ducks in a row. That begins when you call Moshe Albert. Give him a call right now at 718-644-1594. That's 718-644-1594. He is the best in the business, so you want to make sure to give him a call or email him at albertmoshe at gmail.com. Like I said, I really hope you were able to gain from this episode, and please share it with a friend of yours. Share it with um, anyone that may be able to benefit and get the strength from a guest like this. Enjoy, everybody. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Thank you so much for, for joining us, for coming in. We really, really appreciate it, especially now with, with what's going on in the world. It's super important to speak to you know Holocaust survivors and so, some people who have survived the worst atrocities known to man. Um, always, it's always important, but especially now with what's going on in the world. If you can, you know, tell us a little bit about your your childhood, uh, where you grew up, when you grew up, and and what that was like. I am, as you know, a Holocaust survivor. I was a very young girl, happy with my parents, my brothers and sisters. We lived a tranquil, peaceful, happy life. At the beginning of 1944, the Germans invaded our town, Berexas, and the problem started right there and then. They confiscated my father's businesses. Within a short period of time, they also asked us to pack up and leave our home. How old were you? How old were you when that happened? I was 12 years old. And did you, yeah. I mean, as a 12 year old, did you understand what was going on at that moment? Not to the full extent, but I felt already the sadness naturally. Yeah. As we had, we had to pack up, as I mentioned, this year, in a hurry. And we were taken to the brick factory in our town, renamed the Ghetto. And there were thousands of us in that ghetto. All the Jews of our town and the nearby villages were taken there. The conditions were sad. We slept on the floor 
in the open view with all the other families from our town and villages. We were about a, a month or so in the ghetto, and again we were asked to leave the place, take the minimum of our luggage. We were taken to the railroad station. And this is without uh, knowing anything of where they're taking you or of course i mean not. like of course you, you, you said it so no. so you know even so quickly and, and flippantly in a way like you were taken out of your home your father's business was taken away from him that's that's not a normal thing to happen you know especially before the holocaust took place like right now we think about it we think about it in regards to what happened in the holocaust it was very very sad as a young girl i did not quite comprehend the whole sadness of the situation. But my parents and my older siblings, we were not able to smile much as we used to before the Germans invaded and we lived peacefully. Life was, I imagine life was, it was fun, like any other child. You every had child, like everybody else or most of the people, have fun. They go to school, they learn. They play, we jump, we dabbled, we had our uh, prayer books also naturally, you know, when we said, anyway, um, as we were taken from the ghetto to the railroad station, one of the uh, guards said that we, had, we are going to be taken to a working camp. They pushed between eight and a hundred people into those wagons, not knowing where we are going. It took us a few days. The food was very limited, so was the drink. The children were very uncomfortable. There was only room either to stand or to sit very tightly. And we had arrived at Auschwitz. We did not realize the location that we were and what's going to happen to us. We were ordered to leave all the luggage at the railroad station, saying that we will be given, it will be delivered to us later on. <sighs> Family members, we were ordered to line up, separated the man from the woman. The only luggage that my father was able to take with him was his talus bag, which contained the talus and tefillin. When one of the officers saw that he has that bag under his arm, he grabbed it from my father and threw it down onto the floor. My father asked him, please, I only want that one item to be taken. <laughs> the Gestapo said, man, where you are going, you are not going to need it. We didn't know what it meant. I know now. And then the selection began. The brutal selection. There was a, a man named Dr. Mengele. I don't know how many of you people knew that name, but he was the doctor of death. With a thumb, a motion of his thumb, he selected the young able bodies the, to go to the Right, the young woman with children and the elderly people to the left. I went with my mother as he pointed Mengele to the left. After walking a few steps, my mother asked me where my sisters are. I said, Ma, they went the other side. We will soon meet. We didn't know what it means. I want to ask you about 
about your sisters. You, you mentioned you have sisters. I How many two, siblings do you have? We have two sisters and a sister-in-law, older than me, yeah, who Mangala pointed to the right. Yeah. How many siblings did you have altogether? We were uh, 10 siblings. Wow. Five of them were killed, including my parents, my two younger sisters with their children. Were they were they killed later on, or was it when the, when Mengele, you know, selected them to go to the left? They selected them to go to the left. Yes. So right when you get to the so to the camps, I went also with my mother to the left. But when my mother asked where the other sisters are, I said they went to the other side. We will soon meet, Ma. Yeah. She let go of my hand and she said, "Go run after them." I said, go run after them. I ran after them. Mangala was blinded. No one from the left were able to cross over to the right. He didn't see me. This is how with Hashem and my mother saved my life. It was one of the occasions. So meaning you, you were able to, which is unheard of, you were able to run behind Mengele and he didn't, he didn't see you and he would usually see everybody. As I said, he must have been blinded that he did not see me crossing over from the left to the right. But, but, but your mother was... Going to the right meant that the, the young people, the able bodies who would be able to work. But your mother was still on the left. My mother was still alive. She went to the, she remained going to the left. <sighs> After a few days at Auschwitz, I asked one of the Gestapos, I had the nerve to ask her, but I'm going to be together with my father and mother. <sighs> he pointed to the crematorium <sighs> where the smoke was coming from the chimneys. And he said, See the smoke coming from the chimney? That's hot. And at this point, you're 13 years old. Go survive that. And we know that my two married sisters with their children in their arms, the toddlers holding on to her thighs, were taken to the to take a bath as they were entering the building of the showers, yeah? <sighs> Holding their children, the Gestapo, instead of water running from the, they release poison gas, all of them fell to the floor dead and their bodies then taken to the crematoriums. As I was saying, these people at Dr. Mengele who studied in the universities to heal people became a doctor to kill people. Engineers they were taught at universities to build roads, bridges, houses, build crematoriums. <sighs> Where the dead bodies were burned. I, I want to ask you, when, when the Gestapo told you that he pointed to the crematorium, you're a 13-year-old girl at this point. How do, you, how, do you, how do you... I fainted. My sisters were there next to me. They picked me up. What can I tell you? How many sisters were, were with you on the right side? All of you? Two, two of your sisters? Two sisters. And what about the rest of your, rest of your siblings? They were the two married sisters 
went to the gas chambers with their children. And two of my brothers were still alive in Auschwitz. You know, they were 16, 18. But you, you weren't with them. You, you didn't no, see no, them. No, no, we were separated. Yeah. Men and boys were separated. And it was, far, it was far away from each other. You weren't seeing each other. But I know that they were not taken to the left to the gas chambers. They were young, able bodies, apparently. Did you ever uh, think about why, why this evil person, Dr. Mingla, why he sent you to the left as a 12 year old? Did you ever think about that? <laughs> what I can think about is that he was not a human being. He was a beast. No human being would do to innocent, righteous humans what he did. <sighs> Life in Auschwitz was horror. Yeah. It's indescribably bad. I happen, we happened to work near the railroad station where all the luggages from the hundreds of thousands or million Jewish families arrived. There were mountains and mountains of luggage. And what we had to do is separate them. The silverware were taken into separate bands like kiddish cups, candelabras, and other that the minimums that the Jewish people, especially the religious one, took along. Clothes were also separated. The Germans were suspicious that all the women who arrived did not have any jewelry on them. So they asked us to rip open shoulder pads, coat hands, and other muffs, you know. And we found lots of the jewelry there, rings, watches, earrings, necklaces, they were all of that confiscated, put into a van, and the chair, they loaded truckloads of those valuables. I'm going to make the story short, okay? Yeah. It, all this reminds me of what the Hamas is doing now to those innocent children in Israel. When we were lined up, the young and able bodies of work, they tattooed us. We were not called by names. We were called by numbers. And I have a tattoo on my arm also. Was that on the first on the first day that you got there? Was that on the first day that you arrived at Auschwitz? It was so yes, pretty soon after. I don't know if it was the first or the second day, but very soon after we arrived, yeah. <clears throat> Every morning we had to had the head count. And by the head count they were again thousands of us, yeah. By the number, <laughs> one morning, I was quietly saying the morning prayer. The Gestapo saw my lips moving. He asked me, who am I cursing? <laughs> I didn't know what to answer. And I kept saying, I, I. And the girl in the line next to me spoke up. She said to the Gestapo, she's only reciting a poem. <laughs> that girl saved me from a lot of beatings or verse. 
Do you know who that? Do you know who that girl was? No. And she? No, unfortunately, not the name or anything. No. A lot of the young women who were not able to take the atrocities and try to escape were electrocuted by the wires. The, all of the Auschwitz camps were wired with electrical wires. As I started to say before, in 19, uh, January the 18th, 1945, we were the last ones leaving Auschwitz. It was called the Death March. Before, before you get there, I want to ask you, I want to ask you about, you know, the day-to-day -day life in, in Auschwitz, the, the sleeping, the waking up. I imagine it wasn't uh, an eight o'clock wake up, relaxed environment. You know, for, for many people listening, it's possible they, they know a survivor or, or they've spoken to some, but for many people, maybe they, this is the first time they're hearing a survivor speak. Can you it speak was, about the... It was a very early, we didn't have watches to look at the time, but it must have been between six and seven o'clock in the morning. And after that, they, we were taken to work. Some of us were working at factories where we, um, parachutes were made. Others were working at different places. Towards the end of Auschwitz, me too, with my sisters, were trucked to a factory where they made parachutes. All I can remember is, you know, working with the robbers. Were you, were you, with, your, with, were you with your sisters throughout your time in, in the camp? Yes, I was. Luckily, I was with my sisters all the time. Yes. And they were, they were older than you? Yes. Yeah, they were older than me. Yeah, quite a number of years older, but young girls, nevertheless. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you, you know, sometimes we, when we think people like my age, when we think back about this time, it's hard to comprehend what happened. But you're living there and there's thousands of people in Auschwitz. D did you have people that you became friendly with, people that you would, you know, speak to and you got to know in the camps that did that, that chesed for you, that helped you out? Of course we spoke to each other, but each and every one of us felt sad. There was no smiles. There were no jokes talking about. We were exhausted from work. The food was a slice of dry bread with some kind of fluid for lunch. And, uh, <clears throat> the beating that we saw, if someone did anything that was not to the Germans' liking, were beaten mercilessly. You cannot smile when you see things like that happen, and you cannot tell jokes either. So most of the conversation with the rest of us was the sad life that we are living. There was no, there was no way to be distracted from that. <laughs> All we were able to do, those who remembered, the prayers to pray that Hashem will have mercy on us and let us survive. How many how many years did you did you spend in the camps before liberation? Well, we arrived in Auschwitz around the, uh, the April May, approximately till of what year? Nineteen forty four. And we left Auschwitz January the 18th, 1945. So you're, you were there, you know, around a year and a half. And in the meantime, while no, we, are, we are there. Less than a year and a half. You, you, no, you, it's April 1944. 
Oh, oh, so you were, it was like six months. So you were there. You were in the camps around six months. More than six months in Auschwitz. You were in the camps for, for nine months. Approximately, yeah, approximately. And during those days, the months, we knew already when we saw the smoke coming from the crematorium that all those innocent, young and old Jewish peoples were being guessed and their bodies burned. By then we knew already what Auschwitz was all about. But still, we, we wanted the life to go on. Lots of them committed suicide also. They couldn't bear the yeah. pain. I, I, I'm thinking, you know, about your, your time there and, you know, seeing such awful things happen to you, to the people you know, and, and you, you, you I knew at that point that you had lost so much of, of your family or your parents. Where did you have the strength to, to keep going every single day? It is a very good question. All I can say is, that God wanted us to survive, to keep living and hoping that this will end and we will become a free people and live a normal life. This is all we could think about. If you would constantly think of the miseries that we went through, you wouldn't live. So there was still hope in us that things will improve. How do you, I mean, what, what gave you that hope though? I mean, seeing what's happening, and you had mentioned people didn't have the hope that you had. Many people, you know, couldn't handle it. The hope was that we saw our sisters and we, I don't know, should I say it, supported, supported each other's, not to let go. We have to hope that this will end hopefully soon and that life will continue. So you gave each other chizuk. A hundred percent. That's really special. We we had to. That was the only thing that kept us alive, really. You know, I've, I've interviewed a number of Holocaust survivors, and it's the first time I'm hearing, you know, about that, that interaction between survivors, about giving each other chizok. When we woke up at night from the horrible dreams, my sister... We said uh, different bunks, yes. Yeah, said, please, fella, don't think about what you dream. Think for a better future that we will survive and that we will live yet a peaceful life. Don't dream the horrors that you are going through. She kept us telling us that. So, you know, some, some could say that when you were, what you're going through, what you're going through, dr dreaming was the best moment of the entire day. No, the dreams were not, the dreams were horrible dreams. The dreams were, were worse the than the reality. The dreams were what we went through, what we were thinking, where our parents are, where my young married sister and the children are. Those were... Uh, Horrible dreams. Yeah, so there's... I will describe yet a little bit about the uh, death march. Yeah. It was on January the 18th, 1945. Yeah. And there were still thousands of us alive who left Auschwitz in a cotton dress, wooden clocks, very 
thin blanket marching day and night without any food or any drink, without any rest. And those of us who wanted to sit down on the snowy wet road to rest was immediately shot by the Gestapo. So the gutters and the roads were full with young Jewish boy, girls' bodies. There was a time when I said to my sisters also that I cannot walk anymore. I have to sit down and rest. They knew what will happen to me if I do. They will shoot me. Although they had hardly any strength themselves, they held me up and dragged me the rest of the way until we arrived to camp Ravensbrück, not a death camp. And we got to Ravensbrück, all of us just collapsed in the yard, in the wet lane. I woke up in the morning. I saw so many dead bodies. Mm -hmm. How do you survive that? <sighs> this is what the Nazis the intellectuals, the educated men would do to decent human beings. <sighs> I am only sorry that Hitler committed suicide. I would have liked to see him suffer, cut his hand and feet. <laughs> Feel the pain that we felt. <sighs> From Robertsburg, we went further to still another camp called Neustadt Gleve. <laughs> By then, <laughs> we didn't look like humans anymore. We were all skin and bone. We were so hungry. <laughs> One night, I snuck out from the barracks to go to the garbage can and look for some food, anything I would find there, potato pills or whatever. I was so hungry. <laughs> A Gestapo saw me, and he beat my skinny bone body so badly. He asked me, you know, where do you think you are going? And when I said I'm going for some food to look. You verpflicht Jew, you whatever it means, you dirty, filthy Jew, and that's where he beat me. When I came to, I managed to crawl back, hand and feet, to the barracks. In nineteen. Uh, on May the 2nd, 1945, we were liberated. We... Which, which camp were you in on May the 2nd, 1945? Was liberated on May the 2nd, 1945. Um, I mentioned the name before. 
Neustadt Gleve. What was it Neustadt Gleve, the name and, and of you, the, the camp. And you survived. You survived the death march. We survived, but we didn't look like humans. We looked like dead human beings, really. So as but many, many, many people. I mean, they they called it the death the death march for a reason. Many people didn't didn't survive that. We have no idea how many young Jewish women bodies were lying there on the road because they couldn't take the march. When you got to the other camp. And even in Auschwitz, you know, you grew up as a as a from Jew, and there are Yom Tovim, there was Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur that that are on the calendar. But you know, it's was there any any story, any moment, maybe with a Pesach or something that you remember, uh, something in the camp? I only know that we were thinking, is this the day that is a Rosh Hashanah? Or Yom Kippur, or Sukkot, but we couldn't observe anything. Some of us who were able to stay away for a day or two without eating bread, because there was no matzah, but the hunger was so great that we had to eat the bread on Pesach. I heard a story about B'tichas chametz that you did in the camps. Is there a story about selling a cigarette for chametz? It probably did take place, yeah. But personally, I don't, I haven't seen it happen, but it did. Remember, I was a young girl. Right. And suffering so much. But there were, I know, th those who were able to exchange something for food. Yeah, and the starvation was unreal. I think I mean, a relative of yours, maybe a great nephew, told me a story about a time where you you sold chametz for a cigarette to be able to sell the chametz. Do you do you recall that? <laughs> I know that it happened. Right, yeah. but you're young, right? But yeah, there were I, other exchanges also. Even some people exchanged. I don't know exactly yeah. what for a slice of bread. Yeah, you know. So the there was there was no there was no uh, you know nowadays we have Shabbos and Yontif and and Baruch in a way we, we we could take it for granted but you wish you had it then you wish you had you know sometimes we roll our eyes about a three-day yantif oh uh, yantif is another day what does a three-day yantif mean to you now we thought a lot about those days but some of us were not sure what day that yantif is when it is yom kippur when it is rosh hashanah the calendars yeah. you know they're unknown and of course, my older sisters probably knew a little more than me. Remember, the focus was so strongly on surviving. But I know, and I have heard, and it did happen, that some of them knew the day, and they tried to fast on Yom Kippur, for example, yeah? Yeah. Was there was there any items, anything that your mother, you know, had given you before she went to the to the left and then you ran to the right? Was there anything that she gave you that you were able to hold on to to have? No, my my mother also had one book in her hand. I don't know if it was a tilim or a sidur, you know, that she had actually under her coat. But uh, everything took place so suddenly. We couldn't say goodbye or I'll see you, Ma. Right. Or, or to say I love you or anything. 
It was undescribable. It was just not human. We'll be right back to this episode in just a second. It happens to be, I went to the oil this morning, uh, the resting place, little Baba Treba, and everybody was looking at my shirt and being like, oh my gosh, how is your collar so firm? Is that, is that what I think it is? I'm like, it is, it is. It's a Collars & Co. shirt. Look at this shirt, fellas. Look at it. This is a full button down shirt. I wear this every Shabbos and sometimes during the week. It is strong. It looks great. And it is super comfortable, stretchy, feels great. You can breathe. You can feel good. And only at collarsandco.com can you get a shirt like this. So head to collarsandco.com. Make sure to use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off your purchase. I guarantee you will love their shirts. You are going to love their shirts. Your kids will love their shirts. And more than everything, your wife will love that you're wearing those shirts. They are amazing. They look good. They feel good. You're going to like the way you look that I stole from Men's Warehouse. Sorry. Anyways, you're going to like the way you look. Go to collarsandco.com. Make sure to use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off. Now, a word from our friends at Town Appliance. Ever since 1979, they have been the number one place to go for appliances. You need a refrigerator, you need an oven, you need a grill, whatever it is, a washing machine, a dishwasher, you go to Town Appliance. They understand the needs of the firm community. They understand how to work with you. And you go WhatsApp them. How cool is that? Have you ever been able to WhatsApp your appliance store before? I don't think so, but now you can at Town Appliance. Hit the link in the show notes in the description of this episode. Send them a message on WhatsApp. They have the most incredible customer service. I myself have benefited from their customer service. And so will you, again, like I said, number one in the business from since 1979. Which town are they? They are the town, the only appliance store that you need to know about. You can head to townappliance.com or send them a message on WhatsApp. Now back to this episode. Before the war, did you have dreams of what maybe you would do when you're older? You know, many of us, we dream of maybe becoming a lawyer or a doctor. When you were younger, did you dream about a certain thing that you would do? Not to me, but I'm sure that many of them did. Yeah, we were just happy going to school learning, playing, being a Jew, having fun. Yeah. After our serv- after we were liberated, yeah, right. and a couple th- a days or a week after, well, the search started for surviving family members. So they're all looking for who survived from the family. So as we left Germany and we tried to get back home to our town, you know, through Germany, Poland, Hungary. And that's where we heard that one of my brothers is also looking for survivors. So we knew that one brother survived. We didn't know yet which one. Can can you tell me about you know, the moments leading up to liberation in the camp. Did you, did you know that that was about to take place or was it completely by surprise? The, the, the horror that you had lived in the camps, did you know that it was coming to an end? By, by we did not know. We no did clue. not know when we are going to be liberated or anything like that, no. However, when it did take place... Yeah, could you tell me about that moment, about the moment of liberation? What do you remember from the, that? Uh, the moment of the liberation, those of us who were able to crawl out of the camp into this town where we were, and we went into the homes of the Germans, anything we saw, it, I remember it's um, seeing um, oil in a bottle. I just started to drink the oil. <sighs> that probably wasn't the... <sighs> I got sick from it, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> so we were looking for food. That was the first thing, anything. To drink or to eat. And anything that we saw, we didn't know the difference if it is a spoiled item or not. We just grabbed and tried to bite into it. 
Did did the, did did somebody liberate the camps? Did the Americans come into the camps? It was the Russians who Russians. liberated. Well, I was the Russian who liberated. Yes, yeah. And uh, the Russians they liberated us, but it was tough with the Russians. Not very hard. And we tried to find our way home. You know, as I said, yeah, to find if there were any survivors any family or friends yeah and that's when we heard that a brother is also searching for us which meant that you know we didn't even go into the, our house they did not let us in to, to, then, to your old house my own house yeah you know what they said is when they asked who am i who are we looking for what is your name and we mentioned the name spitz my sister said, this is our house. We live here now. Really? And this is our home now. And we have heard incidences where survivors coming home, and when they reach their houses, whoever occupied their home was thinking that the survivors are going to repossess their houses or homes. Psh, psh, psh. Shot them dead. You're telling me there were survivors that were killed after? Oh, there were a lot of survivors by, who were killed after the sur After uh, they survived? Uh, yes, yes. By people who thought they were coming to take their house. People thought they were coming to take their house back. Exactly. That the cyber will repossess their belongings, they shot them. Yeah. So oh. we had straight to the railroad back to Budapest where we met my brother. My and brother Schmelk. And later another brother. My brother Shaya. Did your now, brother did your brother you said you, you you met your brother by your old house? Did your brother find any items? My brother who was not a concentration camp. He was constantly in hiding. He managed to escape Auschwitz or other death camps. Soon after the place was liberated, he went back home. He was the one who actually buried some items in our Sukkah. We had a sukkah uh, uh, in our backyard, yeah, and he buried there four candelabras, one menorah. I don't know if uh, anything else. My mother used to have a, a beautiful white shawl that he used on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. He was also buried and obviously found, I still have that. It is my most precious possession. I have two candelabras that I use every Friday night and you answer. Wow. One of my brothers got the menorah that he used every Hanukkah, you know. Yeah. When did you, I guess, if you could tell me about the t when you made your way to the United States after the war, you know. As we arrived to Budapest, yeah, mm -hmm. when we met my Your brother. brother, yeah. The communists were taking over Hungary and we were advised to leave soon. I don't remember how long we stayed in Budapest, but a few months and from there we escaped to Vienna. 
The organization, the Hayas organization, was very helpful in helping the survivors to get to places. The United States did let us in. Israel was still British. The British were, yeah. Yeah, did not let us in either. So we ended up in the DP camp. It stands for displaced persons. In the DP camp, I and my sisters had to wait 40 years to get to the United States. Four years in the DP camp. Today, the United <laughs> States lets in by the millions. The border is open now. The border is open. Did you think, you know, now that you live in America for as long as you do, how old were you when you came to America? You were, you were 19, 18 when you came to America? Younger? 17? I came as a Jugend. Jugend, I don't know what it is called. Youth, you're young. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was actually assigned to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh man, to a family. Do better? Yeah. <laughs> okay. How long did you live in Pittsburgh for? Who wanted to adopt me. <laughs> it's another story. Okay. Anyway, so I stayed in the uh, Budapest, where my brother, Shia, who survived and married. In 1946, in 1946, yeah, in the DP camp. He, he married someone in the DP camp. So he met his wife there. He met his wife, he married, yeah. And one of the, their children was born in the camp. In DP camp. Wow. Yeah. Oh, but hi. That's her. Yeah. Wow. You were born in the DP camp. Wow. Yeah, lots of, you know, young people who found partners to marry. Wow. Wow. So I was the first one from my family who left the United States. I was, my brother came in 1950. 1950, he stayed in Manhattan, in New York, in Manhattan, yeah. We were in contact, my brother, knowing that I am in Pittsburgh alone, encouraged me to come to Manhattan and to live with him. <laughs> I more than gladly did that, <laughs> okay. So I came to Manhattan. In the meantime, I went to school to learn in Pittsburgh. Yet I went to school and later in Manhattan to improve my condition for making Pernosa a livelihood. Yeah. I took a course in bookkeeping. And soon after I Graduated, I found a job, and soon I was able to. I worked in one office in Manhattan for twenty-five years. Wow, it's 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 so crazy to think about what you had gone through in 1944, 1945, and then a few short years later, you're in Manhattan working. As you went to school to get more bookkeeping. How did you how did you move on? You know, because you went into those camps with a full family. You were one of twelve with your parents, and you walked out of those camps with a lot less, a lot smaller. With how did how did you move on? The sorrow and the bitterness is very hard to describe, but somehow we were created. And wanted life to continue, even though we went through the most horrible experience a human being can tolerate after you are survived. 
you want to continue that life. And you hope that Hashem, that God will give you the strength. I can tell you for an instance, when I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I went to shul because I never for a moment forgot what my parents had taught me to believe in God, to pray to Him. On Shab Shabbat, I went to a shul in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was shocked when I saw people coming in with cars. Hearing their change in the pockets. On Shabbos. On Shabbos. Yeah. There, there's many people, both young and old, unfortunately, that nowadays, in 2023, that will say that what you described over the last 50 minutes didn't happen. That it didn't happen. What would you say to somebody who says that the Holocaust didn't happen? The denials. Yeah. I would say to them, if your child, your wife, your parents, your siblings were taken from you, slaughtered, killed brutally, never to come back to you, would you still deny it? Would you still be a denial if all your family members were gassed, their bodies burned or thrown into knobs? Would you still deny it? Can you believe? Can you believe that there are people like that? No, no. Those who deny know that it happened. They have spoken to survivors. They have read newspapers and magazines. They have seen pictures, movies, and they still deny it. Is that human? No. So what I'm asking, the denials, Be human and realize and know that it did happen to the Jewish people. Six million innocent humans were slaughtered. Many people now, you know, I want to talk about what's going on now in the world. You know, we had mentioned briefly about Hamas. I. All I can tell you is what I hear now is going on in Israel. My heart breaks. Hamas are terrorists, just like the Nazis. They come into Israel. They grab babies, children, young women, older ones, kill them, parade the dead body on the street. Is that human? Nobody should be allowed to do that. And they blame Israel for retaliating? It reminds me of Pearl Harbor. What happened when Pearl Harbor was bombed? What did the United States of America do? They went into Japan with the atom bomb and bombed Hiroshima, Nagasaki, in self-defense. What did the United States do when they destroyed the Twin Towers? They went to Afghanistan for 10 years. They went after Bin Laden. They went to Iraq, destroyed it, and did not stop until they've found the guilty man, the Bin Laden. Israel has the same right to destroy 
Hamas. Yes. Israel is a country just like the United States, England, or France. We have the right to exist and to have peace. Not only do we have the right, we have the responsibility. And the responsibility for the leaders of Israel is to save the Israeli Jews, their own folks, just like America is doing it, saving their own people. Shockingly, what you're, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's, it's simple math. But maybe similar to what was going on in the world when you were growing up, there's a lot of people that hate the Jews and they hate Israel and they're marching in Manhattan right now as we record and they're marching in Sweden and they're marching in Poland and they're marching in Germany and they're chanting things like gas the Jews and we, death to Israel in 2023. We need a miracle. I know what is happening at the university campuses. <sighs> Professors who learned at universities to be, to teach the students professor, professions and what now they are allowing to actually punch and spit on a Jewish boy who wears a kippah? Professor, you are doing the same thing that Mengele did. You are allowing these atrocities to happen. You are intelligent. You should know you call yourself Democrat. You are not a Democrat, my dear, if you allow all those atrocities to happen. Antisemitism should not exist. We are humans just like you. How angry does it make you to hear that these things happen? There was a vid there was a video a few weeks ago of, I believe it was from Sweden or maybe Germany. I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. From there was a video from Australia where there was a crowd of people chanting, they were proclaiming to gas the Jews. How, <laughs> what, what do you say to that? And I am so sorry that you journalists, the reporters. They are unfortunately lying a lot. They are not calling Hamas terrorists. They are very silent about that. Wake up if you are a human being and if you want to report news, report it correctly. Don't twist the news that the, it's all Israel's fault. No. I have an important, an important question. We're going to wrap up, but I have an important question for you. There's a lot of talk nowadays that what's going on in America and parts of Europe is, is exactly what it was leading up to the Holocaust. What, what do you say? Is that, is that the case? Do you think that's true? I am not a young person anymore. I have lived through a lot of horrors during the Second World War. And I want to see all the people in the world. If you call yourself Democrats, then be a Democrat. Want peace, not hatred. You are not only killing the Jews, you are killing your own people. How many people were killed during the Second World War? You are making a war instead of talking about peace, tranquility. So w would you say that what's going on now is similar? What I am saying is that they should realize that what they are doing is wrong. Go for peace. 
whether that's in Germany, in Italy, in England, in Sweden, or in the United States. Peace, harmony, let the people live a decent human life. No hatred, because if you hate, you're going to be hated as well. There's going to be a war, and those who are hating now will also die. Do you think the Jewish people should be, should be scared? Should we be frightened by what's going on? We hope that there is a God, that he will protect us. We have to do our share, and we have to protect ourselves. We cannot allow to be a, um, a victim again. Uh. Yeah. We cannot allow that to happen. The world and the people must work on peace and tranquility. No anti-Semitism. The campuses should see every religious student to enjoy the studies and to be friends acquaintances, not punching or spitting if he wears a kippah, a head covering. I want to ask you one of the final questions. If you go look at this camera over here, right over here, and imagine there's a student over there, there's a student that has a lot of hatred in their heart, and they're chanting against the Jews, and they're an anti-Semite. What would you tell that student? What would you tell that student? You are a young man. I hope that your parents and the professors will teach you to be a decent young man. Stop the hatred. It is for your own good to be a peaceful person. Don't be a Nazi. Don't be a Hamas who is, who hates. Be a Democrat. Be peaceful. Tell your professors also, I want to learn about peace, tranquility, not hate. The young people are very powerful. You can change the world, but you have to have the right thoughts and the right feelings. Be a proper young person, girls or boys. Realize that war is dirty. Hate is schmutz, filth. Be peaceful. Please, I beg you, I beg all of you, stop the hatred and let us live in peace and harmony. With God's help, we can do it. Mrs. Rabinovich, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening to this episode. First, I want to give a big hello to, what is it, 30,000 more YouTube subscribers that are watching this episode. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Nahi. I usually record with my co-host, Momo. And uh, this is Meaningful People. We're really, really happy that you stumbled upon our podcast and are learning more about our guests, Judaism, Jewish life, and, and whatever else we're talking about. So thank you so much for listening. We love, love, love reading your comments and uh, listening to any feedback you have. You can send us an audio message at speakpipe.com forward slash meaningful minute. Send us an email at meaningfulpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. But please make sure to leave a comment, a re- leave a rating, a review. And we love, love hearing from you. Thank you so much and talk to you soon.